So we're now going to move into our Digging Deeper segment. Uh, tonight's topic is key principles taught in the Old Testament sacrifices. And uh, one of our goals, of course, with these webinars is to invite your participation. We want you to develop the habit of asking and answering questions. So you'll want to make sure that you open the chat function in Zoom, and we welcome you to answer the questions that we've included with each slide. And in addition, please feel free to ask any questions that you have related to our topic tonight. And at the end, Jonathan and I will do our best to respond. So key principles taught in the Old Testament sacrifices. In this episode, we're going to dig deeper into the Old Testament sacrifices. It's, it's actually one of my favorite Bible studies. If one was to bring up animal sacrifice in this modern world, I think most people would, would laugh. They, they'd consider the practice barbaric, a, a relic perhaps from an age when people were unenlightened. But you know what? Rather than being barbaric, the offerings were actually this incredible teaching tool. And when an offerer brought a sacrifice to the tabernacle in the days of Moses or the temple in the days of, of Solomon, the priest would review with them some important principles. And uh, there were five major offerings in the law of Moses. They're referred to in the entire Bible, but most succinctly described in the first six or seven chapters of Leviticus. Now, I've got Jonathan with me tonight, and we're going to play a little impromptu game here. I'm going to reference the chapter of Leviticus, and Jonathan, you're going to tell me, if you can, what sacrifice is mentioned in that chapter. All right, you ready? All right. Yeah, although I think I should say the chapter and use <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sounds I'm not good. ready for that. Okay, Leviticus <laughs> chapter one. What's the offering there in Leviticus? All right, that's the burnt offering. All right. Chapter two, what do we got? Uh, chapter two is the meal offering. All right. The meal offering, or sometimes referred to as the, the grain offering, depending yeah, on the version that you have. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Leviticus chapter three. Uh, Leviticus chapter three should be the peace offering. Peace offering. You're three for three. Amazing. Um, chapter four and five. It's, it's all of chapter four and part of chapter five talks about this offering. Yeah, see, now the stress levels are coming up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sin offering, I think, is uh, right there. There's not many left. <laughs> yeah, that's true. The sin offering. And then the last one is part of chapter five and part of chapter six. And I think it's really closely related to the sin offering. What do we got? Yeah, yeah, very much so. The trespass offering. All right. So, yeah, so that's a little summary if you haven't looked at the book chapters of Leviticus. And what I find really helpful is a, a quick summary that you might want to jot down here because the burnt offering has this important lesson of dedication. And we're going to talk about that in our section here. We've got the meal offering which was the service of a person. They, they, they took what God had given them and they bring it back and give it to God. The peace offering is about fellowship because the offerer actually got to eat part of the animal and share it with the priest. And part of it was given to God as well. The sin offering we all know really well, and that's the one I think we think of, which speaks about forgiveness. And the trespass offering, which was related to the sin offering, spoke about restitution. You had to uh, sometimes make amends for the things that you'd done wrong, either against God or against other people. And what, why I love this section of the Bible is that it's just packed full of lessons. And there's so much we could share this evening. But my goal for us tonight is to take home three lessons. And if we can take home three lessons, I think we'll have done well. So we're going to look at three passages as we are um, normally do in this section. We're going to look at Leviticus chapter one, and this is part of the burnt offering. And in this offering, you have the, the priest preparing the burnt offering. And I'll just read for you uh, verses 6 and 7 and 9. It says, He shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. So, in each of the offerings, as you read the chapter in Leviticus, you're going to find specifics. And in the specifics are lessons. And the key thing you want to highlight in this offering was that the entire animal was burnt upon the altar. Now, in other offerings, parts of the animal were eaten, sometimes by the priest, sometimes by the person who brought the sacrifice, 
and the priest. But here, the burnt offering, the entire animal was burned. In other words, it was given to God. And that's why we say that it refers to dedication. The lesson is, is that God wants your complete service, your complete dedication. He wants us to give him his all, our all, sorry. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Well, here's where you guys get to participate. So we're trying to get you to think a little bit more. So in that context, here's the question for tonight. And remember, just put your answer into the, the chat uh, function here. What it, would the meaning of the smoke ascending to God as a sweet savor mean? In the context of this offering representing our complete dedication of our lives to God, what does it mean that the smoke of the offering was a sweet savor? Or I think you'd understand it better if it was a, a sweet smell. Now, as you're thinking about that, and go ahead and put that in as soon as you are able, but uh, that word there for burn is, is interesting. There's a couple of Hebrew words for burn, and the normal word for burn means to set something on fire. But the Bible here, God, chooses another Hebrew word, which doesn't mean necessarily to burn and char it with flames. It means to turn something into a fragrance by fire. So think incense. You know, in burning incense would create a, a beautiful smell. Think perhaps even of, you know, the fragrance of a barbecue that it, you can smell it from a distance away. Well, this ascended up to God. And what would you say then that the sweet smell refers to? So I'm looking for people's responses here. So it went up to God as something acceptable. Absolutely. That God was pleased um, I like that answer, too. In the Bible, um, things ascending up to God are prayer and incense. So it signifies, really, that when we give our lives to God, he's pleased. When we meditate upon his ways, he's pleased. When we read his instruction book, God is pleased. It's what we can give back to God for all the things that he's accomplished. When we pray to God, when we obey his commands. Now, Jonathan, we were talking earlier about the fact that when you read Leviticus carefully, there's actually one part of the animal that wasn't burnt on the altar and given to God. Can you explain that to everyone, what that was and why that wouldn't be part of the sacrifice to God? Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Dan. So in the seventh chapter of, Le of Leviticus, there's some special instructions that are given just for the priests. And it was for the priest that would be administering the offerings. And as we see here on the screen, it says that the priest that offereth any man's burnt offering, even the priest shall have to himself the skin of the burnt offering, which he hath offered. And so we can, can tell, obviously, he's not going to take charred remains of ash and, and, and use that to himself. He's actually hanging on to the skin, which is not given to God in that burnt offering, it's given to the priest. And if we think about that, especially in the context of these offerings that were fully dedicated to God, and we'll see throughout the rest of the offerings, if we do a, a more in-depth study as well, that there's so much dedication and, and, and giving of oneself, that it's a wonderful thing that the skin isn't offered. You see, God doesn't really care about how handsome I am. I mean, <laughs> of course, we can't say I'm handsome, but he doesn't care about the outward appearance. That's what the skin represents. It's, it's those things that are on the outside. What does God care about? Well, God cares about what's inside. He cares about the stuff that we're thinking. He cares about the stuff that's in our hearts. You know, I've heard this phrase over the years called Sunday Christians or Sunday churchgoers, and that's about it, because they pretend on the outside that they're serving God, and the rest of the time, they're just doing their own thing. And that's not what God cares about. God cares about what's on the inside. Our dedication to God cannot just be a show. And you see, it's really... Just that one lesson alone is just a really good example of how detailed the lessons contained in the offerings are. As you said, Dan, they're, they're not just some barbaric, meaningless killing. They're actually quite beautiful parables.
Yeah, it's it's amazing when you start looking at the details. And I think those who who think of them as just barbaric haven't really looked at what is contained there. And they're almost as as detailed as Jesus parables, I think, when you when you open up that uh, that concept. Okay, let's move on to another of the offerings. And this is the offering I think we're all more familiar with. It comes from Leviticus chapter four. It's the one you you think of, the sin offering. And if you get a chance and read through Leviticus chapter four and the first part of chapter five, you're going to find that there's a lot of repetition because what's happening in those chapters is that description is given of what should be done if a ruler sinned or if the whole nation sinned or if a poor person sinned. Or like on this verse, if just a common, ordinary, everyday person like you or I sinned. So let's read what a person was supposed to do when they sinned. It says, if any one of the common people sin through ignorance, if his sin which he hath sinned come to his knowledge, then he shall bring his offering, a kid of the goats, a female without blemish for his sin which he hath sinned, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering. Now, there's an important concept that jumps out at you here immediately. You can see that this was a sin that was done through ignorance. In other words, these offerings weren't like a, a, a get out of jail card that you, you made a mistake and you wanted to sin and you say, well, I'm going to sin and then I'm going to bring my offering. It wasn't like you're paying a debt. Um, you know, you could sin, you bring an animal, you sin again, you bring another one and you do it as often as you want. It wasn't like that. This, this offering was for a person who realized that they'd done something wrong. And when it came to their knowledge, this was a person who truly repented and wanted to make things right. And that's a completely different spirit than, you know, I'm going to pay my debt. This is a person that's seeking forgiveness. So the question for our audience here and for you all to consider is, why did God instruct the, the offerer to place his hand on the head of the animal while it was killed. So think about that. You're, you're bringing your offering. You're there as the sinner, right there at the side of the altar with the priest. Uh, in other words, you don't bring your animal and drop it off and, and that's it. God asks you to be there and to place your hand on the head of the animal. And uh, you're there while it's offered. And I, I haven't been like a in a situation like this. I imagine there'd be a number of people, maybe me included, that you know, I might faint when I see that. It would have been difficult to watch an animal killed. But there's an important principle that's here. So I start to see at least one answer coming in here uh, from Ashley. She says it would make it really personal. I like what Miriam says here. It's to I identify with the offering. I think it would have become really clear if you're that person, what you said, Jonathan, that sin has a reward and that reward is is death. Yeah, he was identifying himself with the animal, indicating that he deserved to die. Yeah, you're connected. You you guys get this. So it heightens the understanding, I think, of God's mercy shown to us when he forgives us. It might have even also been an opportunity for the offerer to discuss all these principles with the priest, that there's a time there and you're discussing that with the priest. Now, Jonathan, there's so many aspects to these offerings. And on the screen, we're talking about a common person like you and I. And as I understand it, there's different offerings for different classes of people. Can you explain that to us and what that significant might might be? Yeah, definitely, Dan. You know, the, the sin offering was, I'll say, made available through multiple classes of offerings. So for example, if a priest sinned, he was required to bring a bull. And if it was a ruler that had sinned, he would bring a, a male goat. There we go. Yeah. If we had a commoner, it would be a female goat. A, a person that was poor, they could bring a bird. In fact, Jesus's parents weren't well off. And when they brought Jesus as a baby to present him at the temple, they brought two small birds. And for those that were very poor, it was even possible to bring an offering of flour. The wonderful thing about this is that the offering was made available for everyone. And the point is that forgiveness is available for everyone. It's not just about paying for your forgiveness. 
It's not just about those who can afford the extra luxuries. God wants everyone, regardless of their position, of their social status, of their economic status, regardless of any of that, God wants everyone to learn the principles of sin and to recognize the need for forgiveness. Yeah, I guess that makes the point that it wasn't about the sacrifice. It was really about understanding the need for forgiveness and understanding the principles that God was trying to teach. All right, we got time for one more, uh, what I consider to be amazing lesson from these, these sacrifices. And I want to finish actually with one of the offerings that's kind of even been alluded to here that not all of the an the sacrifices were animals. Um, in Leviticus chapter two, there's what's called the grain offering, or um, depending on your version, it's called the meal offering. In fact, I love this in the King James version, which I use a lot, it's called the meat offering because in old English, meat meant, you know, food basically in general. So Ironically, the meat offering of the King James Version was the only one that didn't involve meat, and it involved flour. So look in Leviticus chapter 2, and this is interesting. It says, when you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. So you can see there that the main ingredient this time was flour. Because this offering wasn't a sacrifice for sin, it was a voluntary offering to God, and it represented one's service to God. Now, how do you get from flour to it representing one's service to God? Well, think about it. God gave Israel all the ingredients to make the flour. He gave them the fields, he gave them the seed, he gave them the rain. And what he asked them to do was to plant the seed. And when it grew, the offerer then had to harvest it, he had to thresh it, had to grind it into flour, and then the offerer would take that flour and make it into cakes or wafers and bring it back to the priest and give it back to God by giving it to the priest. So it represents us taking our skills and our resources that God's given us and using them in his service. You might be really good at repairing things. Well, then use those skills to help your neighbor or a person at your church. You might have a beautiful voice that God has given you. Well, use it to praise God. Don't use it for your own benefit. But the interesting thing, as highlighted in this verse here, is that the offerer could actually personalize it a little bit. They could bring it how they liked it. They could bake it in an oven. They could bake it on a griddle. If you continued reading, you could even fry it in a frying pan. And God gave the offerer leeway to prepare the offering the way he preferred or the way he chose. So let's try to apply one of the other details that's in here as you, you sort of get the basis of what this offering is. So the question to respond to is that why did God insist, you know, you wanted to bring it this way or that, but no matter which way you brought it, that it had to be fine flour. And just in case you think, well, maybe we're just using the English there. The, the Hebrew, again, has two words for flour. And one was a meal, kema, which was just a sort of a coarse meal. But there's this other word that's used here specifically, um, which means the finest flour that was ground exclusively from the inner kernels of the wheat. And the theological word book of the Old Testament goes on to say that everyone had access to it, but it was an expensive luxury item that was used um, to entertain important guests. That was one of the use. So why did God, when he said, if you're going to bring me an offering of flour, I want it to be fine flour. What do you think the lesson is there for us in that principle? So we'll just give everyone a minute to think that through and put her down. Yeah, so God wants us to give our best. Um, it means that you've served with your best and most valuable without blemish. And uh, I think the other point there is just brought out there by Jonah as well, that God wanted you to take the fly flour and grind it really fine, um, refine it to a state where it was acceptable to God. All excellent answers. Um, so the priest, I think, would explain these lessons as, as the offerer brought this to God. Now, I think it's possible a person could conclude from this that it's okay to serve God however we want, 
as long as we give our best, you know, that we don't have to follow any rules that if I want to serve God by playing hockey, well, then that's how I'll serve God. Now, that's a dumb example, but but Jonathan, how how did the description of this offering guard against such a dangerous conclusion that we can just serve God however we want? Yeah, thank you for that. And it's it's actually a really important concept for us to to keep at the forefront of our minds because the offerer could cook the sacrifice and prepare it however they wanted. But you see, there were specifics that did have to be followed. And for example, you already noted that it was made with the very finest of flour. It was it was the flour that had like the outside of the kernel of flour or the, the, the kernel of wheat actually removed from it. So it was just this pure inner part that had to be ground down, had to be the very finest of flour. And it also had to contain oil, as we see here on the screen. And later in the chapter, it speaks of the addition of frankincense. And it also says that, look, these things are great. It cannot include leaven or yeast, was what we call it nowadays. And so while God allows us to individualize our offerings of ourself to him, it has to be within some specific guidelines, within some specific boundaries that he sets for us. And we can see that by the fact that he gives just a few options on how to prepare this. And then, of course, it's up to the offerer to do it the way that they align with most, that they like the most, so that it can still be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And what I love about this recipe for this offering hmm. is that each of the ingredients has a symbolic meaning. The fine flour, you have it up on the screen there. It means giving your best. And we mix it with the oil, and the oil is the word of God. And then we include frankincense in that. And frankincense throughout the Bible is prayer. And then just as we referenced in the earlier session back in Corinthians, leaven can represent malice or evil and wickedness. And God wants us to include these good qualities in our service while excluding those evil motives like malice and, of course, wickedness as well. Well, well, thanks so much. I, I think we've finished our time tonight. Thank you so much for helping us see the wonderful lessons here. I'll just give a, a quick little summary of some of the things that we've seen. First of all, you know, these were not Old Testament barbaric sacrifices. They're actually beautiful sacrifices full of scriptural and godly principles and lessons that the priest would help the people understand as they brought their offerings. And they all pointed forward to Christ. You know, you can see how everything that we've looked at where Jesus included prayer, Jesus gave his best. There was no malice or wickedness in what Jesus offered to God. And we've learned that like the burnt offering, we need to dedicate our, our whole selves to God. We've learned that forgiveness is for everyone, not just those that uh, can afford it. Um, it's available to everyone who understands the principles. And we've seen in the meal offering that we are asked not just to 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 ask for forgiveness, but then we have to give our lives in service to God. We must use our individual skills, but use them according to the divine recipe. It's such a beautiful part of Scripture.